Dear everyone, it is a great pleasure to welcome you all to this Nordic Edge Smart City Conference here in Stavanger, Norway. And for the next two hours, I hope you will join us. This is NoHo EdTech 2021. We are now meeting online instead of in a conference hall. And I believe we are over 800 people following this stream online today. We are ready to share news, reflections and ideas from the most innovative people and researchers in the field of edtech, educational technologies, and to hear what they think is important now and going forward after spending endless times in meetings of Teams and Zoom. You will meet people who took matters into their own hands when schools did not deliver or technologies did not live up to expectations. Some people will state that the digital revolution is over. Can that really be the case? At least that's what the MIT Media Lab founder Nicholas Negroponte states. You will also hear from professors who will challenge the way you teach and perhaps give you a glimpse of how edtech will look in a not so distant future. And we might have a couple of surprises for you too. This is the sixth time we have the EdTech, Know How EdTech conference run by the University of Stavanger. As you see, our venue is quite special. We're actually on an electric ferry called Riger Elektra in the harbour of Stavanger, Norway, right on the fjords. And I'm Ingvet Varanger and I will be the host for the next two hours and also tomorrow. And with me here is Andrew Rhodes. Hi, Andrew. Hi. You are my co-host, expert co-host today. It's so great to have you. Thank you. Let me introduce you properly. Uh, you are an experienced teacher and strategic advisor uh, on the school initiative at the technology provider Atea. And you have over 24 years of experience working with teachers with technology as a tool to improve and transform learning. So, uh, together with the two of us, we'll have people coming in from many places in the world. Norway, of course, Denmark, Netherlands, Spain, England, um, in, uh, UK, um, uh, the USA and Canada. And Andrew, tell me, what can we expect today? Well, I think we've got a fantastic lineup of speakers and a very varied programme. So I think there's lots uh, of really relevant topics for everyone working in education. So, uh, looking at the classroom of today, is it possible to have a school without digital tools to help teaching? I think it is possible, but there's very few classrooms where you wouldn't find any technology. But to me, the important thing is not how much technology there is in a classroom, but how it's actually used to support student learning. Nice. Look forward to hear more about that. So, uh, let's get this started. You can follow this webcast on the uh, Nordic Edge platform. And this broadcast from NoHo EdTech is free, good for all. And please share the link if you know, some, know someone who would like to uh, join us. And if you want to engage with our speakers, there should be a, a form below here where you can enter your questions and comments. And we'll, you know, take them up in the program as we go. And our partners that make it possible to do this NoHo EdTech are, as usually, the University of Stavanger, Rogaland County Council, the City of Stavanger, Municipality of Time and tech provider Atea. Elise B. Olsen is our first guest today. She was eight years old when she started her life online by blogging and connecting with people. At 13, she became editor-in-chief of the magazine Reasons Paper that she started herself. Now she is running the magazine Wallet to take a critical look at fashion and curating art while setting up a museum or library of fashion in Oslo here in Norway. The reason we invited her to know how EdTech is that she dropped out of school after one and a half year in high school. And you'll meet her soon. But first, take a look at this. I'm Elise, and I edit Reasons Paper, which is a youth culture magazine. Yeah, it's made by and for young people. It's not like every other youth culture magazine made by 
you know, adult. Ekki það er lítt uh, skjumult. Um, there was lacking a youth magazine or youth culture magazine that was actually having, you know, honest um, reflections about being a young person and um, also kind of reporting on the youth environment and the youth scene from an insider's point of view. How I see it is like, it's 500 people sitting in each of their own bedrooms, spread all around the world, working borderless and genderless and ageless through online, you know, platforms. We created like together a safe space to, to dress however you want and look however you want and be however you want. It's just like pure creativity. Um, you know, if I wouldn't have internet friends, I don't know what I would do. When you can't find what you're looking for in the store or whatever, then you make it yourself. So it means that you're like ultra like imaginative. It's like the very like fundamental part of creating something, doing it yourself and that's essentially what we've always been doing with the magazine. Welcome to NoHo EdTech, Elisa. Now you are 21 years old and you are on this amazing journey from being what I would say directly to you as a school dropout to be an international entrepreneur. So how would you describe your process of dropping out of school? Well, I think it was uh, a decision that was happening throughout the past uh, couple of years um, before actually, you know, making the decision of dropping out of school. And, well, you know, I think that um, this is kind of comparable with uh, a decision that a lot of athletes have to make or any sort of people who are ambitious at a young age and... Um, yeah, and I think that I had something, um, I had opportunities to go abroad, to travel, to do work, and I was actually, you know, in the field of what I was studying. So um, I was, uh, I went to school at Elvebakken Vidrigone School, high school, and... Um, it's a creative school, right? It's a creative school, and it's a, it's a media, it's a, it's a high school that's specialized within the field of media, and... Uh, um, you know, I kind of knew it was going to be a little bit different for me because I was actually working in the field of which I was studying. And um, I mean, I had the most amazing team of, you know, supportive teachers and supportive, you know, a, a support system at the school. Um, so the first year I was, uh, I was, the first year I was, I was in school, I was, uh, you know, working in Paris, working in London, working in Milan. So I was, I had the opportunity to travel around and still, you know, uh, do my, my homework and still, you know, complete my exams and do all of the, the mandatory stuff. And then uh, during the first, uh, half of the second year, um, this new this restriction uh, that was called Fravarsgrensen was uh, was uh, limiting how much time yeah. you could be away from school. Yeah, so it was a you know I needed to be there physically at school, which you know completely um, um, made it impossible for me to to go to school. So I had to make that choice, and you know even years before that, I was you know discussing with my parents, you know. Um, I have these opportunities now, I have to seize these opportunities, I want to go abroad and you know it still took a few years for me to really get ready to make that decision of not coming to school anymore. Um, so but you did it together with your parents? Yeah and I was again very fortunate to have um, a support system at home too and um, you know they were saying you have these opportunities now and you can go back to school later if you if you want to. So looking back now would you say that schools are you know uh, uh, an, an enabler of innovation or a, a hinder? I think it can be both and um, after I dropped out of school myself I've been back to the school to as a you know on the other on the other side of the table teaching. I've been teaching yes wow. and and also uh, doing you know teaching uh, abroad as well at different fashion universities and, and and teaching art direction and you know I still feel you know this teaching thing is kind of weird because I'm you know even younger I could be younger than the than the students or I could be around the same age and that dynamic is a little bit strange so I don't feel 
feel like I'm able to have a keynote present presentation and be like, you know, this is what you all need to to know about this. It's more of a conversational thing. But um, but yeah, I think that school gives you uh, well, school within the sort of traditional educational academic educational system gives you that framework um, to be disciplined that it gives you time and it gives you space to really um, you know delve into a specific theme or a specific subject that otherwise maybe a lot of people wouldn't do so I think it can be both it can have that you know in the right sort of framework and in the right context it can be an enabler of of innovation and um, but I think diversity is very important for me I think the the hard part was to start in a field where I was very much present and where I also felt that the curriculum um, within create you know creative education was uh, was very backwards it was very um you were ahead school. of the curriculum would you say or yeah or I was you know having different perspectives that kind of wasn't you know involved in that discussion at all so I think that um, yeah it was important Any I was I was just gonna ask yeah as someone who's very creative do you feel school helped you develop your creativity or was it kind of a blocker to you being creative because they have these kind of frameworks? Um, for me, I think that, you know, secondary school, for example, you know, ungdomsskolen as we call it in, in Norway between, you know, age 14 to 16. I think that was, that really helped me you know, shape myself and form myself. And and that was mostly because I grew up in the suburbs of Oslo and my I went to a, pu a public school, so it was very diverse, a lot of people from different, you know, with different interests and different backgrounds. And I think that was kind of, you know, that was, uh, that was extremely important when it comes to my education because I, uh, you know, when I, when I started high school and I came into this, this media class, everyone was the same as me, you know, everyone wanted to do the same thing that I wanted to do. And, I think it became kind of, uh, you know, narrow. I felt like yeah. I was in a bubble in a way. So. so actually the diversity was a big help to you yeah. kind of opening up what you wanted to do. And I think that's been really important because for me, you know, um, after dropping out of school too, conversations have been in incredibly important and conversations with people from different backgrounds and with different perspectives and, you know, fashion and art and culture and creativity in general, it can be a bubble and it's, it's very isolating and you also at times feel lonely and I think it helps to broaden these perspectives and sort of open up into different fields. So if you could dream up a school that you wouldn't drop out of, what it looked like you just said or do you have any ideas to share? Um, I think that, you know, today we are exposed to so much information and so much knowledge online and I think that, you know, school, that's not what school is it's, and maybe shouldn't be anymore in my opinion you know I think that school should rather be about empowering you know conversations and critical thinking and dialogues and you know again these different perspectives and also you know learn like teach you at a very young age how to actually process this information that we can easily access online because the students are already digital, because yeah. you know everything. Yes, and because, you know, uh, the internet is this kind of vast archive where you can learn about history and you can, you know, you can learn about the past and the present and the future, but you need to also um, have conversations and you need to sort of, you know, process these, these things on your own in order to sort of make the right output in a way. Mm. It's interesting what you say about all the content being available, because mm. I think schools still tend to teach an awful lot of content yeah and uh, and it's interesting also with the selection of content and you know for me as well you know I, I I think that a lot of the stuff that I do on a professional I don't I don't feel like I have one position but I'm more of a of a facilitator that's may you know maybe the, the the position that I feel like I embody the most a curator and a, and a facilitator facilitating different conversations different visual expressions um, and you know also selecting you know what goes in and what goes out you know it yeah, go ahead, Anna. I was just going to say, it's really interesting that you use the word facilitator mm. and also that you talk about the fact that you don't 
really feel like a teacher because there's a lot of discussion in education when all this information is available to students that yeah. actually teachers should be more facilitators of learning mm. rather than necessarily experts in yeah. a particular field. And I can only speak from the experience that I have and from what I know and what I've you know, uh, taught myself or been taught. And I think that that's also what makes me kind of more fit um, into the sort of mentor or mentorship role rather than a you know, classic teacher. Because that's very interesting, because you are a very successful entrepreneur, but you still have no degree. Mm. We talked a little bit about that yesterday, that you might go back to school at some point. Yeah. Uh, but for many people, to have a degree is, you know, vital for them to be able to open their mouth and state something with kind of um, uh, ponders or like... Um, uh, and and you, you choose a totally different path. Mm. I mean, why do you think you've become so successful? <laughs> um, I think that defining success is also, you know, an interesting, an interesting thing because I, I don't feel like I'm nowhere near to, you know, my full potential yet. But um, I think that, you know, I've always been a very curious person by nature, and I've, I've I grew up very, you know, I was very nosy. I was a bit shy, but I was, you know, nosy, and I always wanted to speak to the adults. I always wanted to sit at the adults' table when it was, you know, family dinners and stuff. I always wanted to engage in the, in the discussion. Um, but also, my interests were very multifaceted. And again, I think that part of um, you know why I'm doing what I'm doing is because I'm interested to hear and to gather you know, a lot of people's perspectives on things. And I think that that's been incredibly helpful. And I also think that I'm constantly learning and dropping out of school you know i you know i kind of took off my student in the in the you know traditional sense of the word hat and then i put on a new hat which was you know if i'm going to drop out and i'm going to you know have sort of manage the 24 hours in the day by myself i really need to always stay curious and to always learn and to uh, always stay updated within my field and um also, you, you mentioned in my introduction as well, which is very kind, um, but you, you mentioned um, the fact that I left my position as editor-in-chief at eight, age 17. And, you know, I've decided to, to, to have these, you know, to create this narrative around my projects and to step away from these positions when I, when I feel done with it. And I think that that's also an, an important thing, that everything can be temporary and that I have a specific duration in mind of all my projects and that you know I, I think that most of the magazine projects and publishing projects that I've done has to do with my f sort of self-education you know I you know Wallet magazine which is a fashion criticism publication has essentially been you know uh, a master's a master's degree for me because I've specialized in all these different fields we've done 10 10 issues about very specific themes and um so I've learned, yeah, I've, I've, I'm, yeah, I'm learning as I'm going. And I think that being open to learning is an incredibly important quality and also something that we see more and more of my generation as well. You know, we don't educate to become, uh, you know, a photographer or a journalist. Uh, or an engineer. Or an engineer anymore. I think it has more to do with, you know, the, the, like, we're more holistic, you know, we think about um, various different sides of the story. And, and that has to do with, with the internet again, you know, online, we're forced to create these personas and these um, universes around, around ourselves. So we need to look at stuff from different directions. And so wrapping up, Elisa, uh, curiosity is your driving force, maybe. That's yeah, that's something that school could be better at, perhaps? I think that, you know, facilitating more of these conversations and, you know, maybe stepping away from the, the specific sort of um, keynote, you know, teacher to student dynamic, I think that we, you know, there's so much more between the teacher and the student and between the students and between the teachers and that it's, you know, it, it's all about conversation and, and, and facilitating, you know, important conversations, yeah. Thank you so much for coming, Elisa. Thank you for having me. And uh, Elisa's story is an example not only of what we may see as a gap, but even as a conflict between a system of education based on traditional framework conditions and what the current framework conditions are opening up for. And the gap may be explained as a cultural gap between generations or perhaps a digital gap or both. In the next section, we'll look into three cases that in different ways purposely apply unique features of digital 
technology on specific educational goals, which with traditional means would have been hard to achieve. And we will touch base on adaptive learning, accessibility and inclusion to show you how you can change the classroom and teaching. The first case is about gamification in the classroom. Roger Gautun is a teacher at Roseland Junior High School in the municipality of Time here in Norway. And for the past six years, Roger has been developing a teaching method for all his teaching at fifth to seventh grade based on the methodology of computer games. He says that the idea is that the students get increased motivation through a more exciting and customized learning experience where they encounter challenges that are well known from the gaming world. The pupils solve different tasks where they have a creative freedom in how they want to achieve their learning outcome. And then Roger, the stage is yours. Thank you. So yeah, gamification in the classroom, that's what I've been trying to do in the last uh, years. I was uh, lucky enough to be uh, at this uh, expo three years ago uh, and th there was this word that got stuck in my head and uh, the word was gamification. I went home, did some re research, and tried to find, it, I find out exactly what this was and um, uh, I got really engaged in, in, in this world. Uh, and gamification sounds like something uh, the kids do, they sit at home uh, at the computer, play some games, but it's really taking elements from the games and uh, implementing it into the real world. So um, an example is uh, when you buy 10 pizzas, you get one for free, that's a part of gamification, you want to get that free pizza, so, so therefore you buy 10 to, to achieve this. I wanted to try to implement that, this in the classroom and uh, for the last three years I've been developing this. Uh, the two first years I did this physically. I made some cards and uh, wrote a task on the cards and on the back side there was this reward that the students could collect when they finished the task and got it accepted. Uh, it was <laughs> a lot of work for me to do because I had to write it, I had to uh, check it, I had to give out the rewards. Uh, so, so I figured I could try to make this digital. Uh, so the last year uh, it all went uh, to the computers and, and uh, we have uh, 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 tablets at our school, so in my presentation there will be screenshots from the, from the tablets uh, about uh, uh, how this works. Um, here you see the front screen uh, when they log in uh, at the tablet and it's uh, Sobrenia, that's the name of the fantasy world <laughs> all the students live in in the classroom. Um, why I wanted to do this was to increase motivation and uh, uh, all, the, all the kids really uh, respond well to this, some better than others and I will talk a bit about that uh, in, in the presentation. But uh, first I want to show you exactly how this works. And uh, the first thing that will <laughs> uh, come up is this screen, the login screen. And uh, the students need to choose a name, uh, choose which class they go in. My class is the 7A, uh, so all my students have to choose 7A. And they get a choice which character they want to play. It's an archer, a magician and a warrior. Uh, it doesn't really mean much, but it's a choice that makes a little difference. Uh, the presentation, the, the slides will be in Norwegian, but I, I will explain them in English. So when they start the game, they get this profile screen. This is me, I'm Roger, uh, and here you can see on the top right corner I have 10 coins, 10 gold. That's my, uh, my, my rewards for doing different tasks. On the top left corner you can see I'm level 2. That means that I have done some tasks and increased my level. Uh, in the middle you can see attack, health and magic. That's the character's uh, strength, so they can build their character to do different things. Um, this is the important page, it's, uh, it's the, the tasks. Uh, we call them quests, uh, or opdrag in Norwegian. Uh, and, and this is where all the school uh, things happen. So first off, uh, they will meet the uh, Kongen of Onosa, which means the king of Onosa. Uh, Onosa is a city in Subrenia, and uh, this king has different tasks for the students to do. Here you can see three tasks. Uh, they get to choose which one they want to do, 
and uh, as they progress they will get uh, more tasks within that subject. So here you see three tasks, uh, one is uh, English, one is Norwegian and one is math based and as they choose one task, uh, for example the math uh, uh, task, they get different math, math tasks afterwards. When they do a lot of tasks in the same area, so if I do all, a lot of math tasks, I will unlock different characters. On the left side of the screen you can see there's a character named Ant. Uh, that's a nature-based uh, character, so, so this uh, profile has done a lot of nature quests. Look at trees and, and animals and, and how the uh, climate uh, changes and, and all those kinds of things. And they unlock the Ant character. In this, uh, the, the, the subject is quite focused, but uh, uh, the difference is that they get to choose what they want to do and how they want to do it. So the subject is, uh, is nature, but uh, you can write, you can draw, you can uh, read, you can make presentations, you can go and explore and, and do the, the same kind of quests, but you choose which uh, type you want to do. Um, here you can see uh, the quest text, so when they choose a quest, they get a little information of what they, uh, what they need to do, where to, uh, where to deliver the quest, where to submit it, and what they get from it. So, uh, as they progress, they will meet a lot of new characters, they get to choose, and the students have uh, really responded well to them being able to choose where to go, instead of me telling them what to do uh, at every, uh, every time. Um, but I still need to tell them to do something um, regular, regularly and then I need to make my own uh, quest within the game that I have to tell the students to do. So it's quite simple, I just write in what they need to do, what they will get in reward and then the 7A character will show up and that's a quest they have to do because that's uh, uh, some, something that really matters to, to, uh, in the curriculum that, that we are having. Uh, this is the page where the students uh, really spend most of the time uh, discussing. Uh, it's the store page, so when they do quests they get the money and they get the experience and as they level up they get access to more things in the store. Uh, and the equipment page is where they develop their character. They need to buy equipment to get more attack, to get more health, to get more magic. Uh, and here you have some examples of some of the equipments they can buy. Uh, some have level requirements, uh, some give you small benefits, some give you large benefits. The, the, the large benefits are more often expensive, and the smaller benefits are not so expensive. Uh, they can also buy food and drink. Uh, as their character loses life, uh, they need to replenish it, and they do that by eating or drinking. And as you level up, you get uh, access to better food that uh, give you more value for money. Magic, if you chose a magic-based character or if you buy magic-based equipment, you can uh, buy magic to, to increase your chances to survive and win the game. And this is the card page. This is where they can buy uh, benefits for themselves, not in the game, but in the real world. So this is a uh, early start. There's only two choices right now. The first one is uh, do pass. That means toilet pass. So if they need to go uh, into the toilet in the lesson, they need to buy this toilet pass and use it and to be allowed to go out. The second card is uh, stop dia, which means uh, time stop. So if they need a break, they can buy this card, take a 10 minute break in the lesson, uh, as long as they don't do <laughs> anything to disturb the other, uh, other students, uh, they can do whatever they want. Uh, the, the free time cards, the, uh, the time stop cards is really expensive, so they need to <laughs> choose when to buy it. Uh, this is often the most uh, talked about page in the start of the game. I've been doing this for, uh, for the two different classes now, and at the start uh, they always talk about how they're going to buy all the free time cards and how they're going to uh, get the benefits. But as the game progresses, no one really buys anything of this. Even though as they progress they get more cards, they can buy better chairs to sit in, they can uh, buy cards to go outside and uh, play in the lessons, they can buy cards to, to not have to go outside in the rain in the break time, uh, and, and, and different kinds of benefits. So th this is 
something that's really uh, only used in the start of the game, and I, and I see that the, the kids buy uh, equipment and, and food and magic uh, when they progress uh, afterwards. So, uh, why do you need equipment? You need equipment to beat monsters. Uh, these are also three different monsters that the students can beat. And if they beat one monster, they get harder monster and, and, and they need to pr progress all the time. Um, these are individually based, so each student had their own monster. And this is what the monster page looked like. It's a bit like uh, Pokemon, uh, if you play that. Uh, you have take each uh, take one turn, and I attack you, and he attack me, and, and when we do this back and forth, one of us is dead. Uh, but I can at any time withdraw and go and replenish my health and come back to, to try to defeat them. So it's, there's a lot of strategic thinking and, and logical thinking behind this. Uh, here you can see uh, that I just uh, may, uh, did one attack and I, I damaged him, he damaged me, I have one health left. If I attack again, he will probably kill me and I, I need to go and, and uh, replenish my health before that happens. If I die, I need to uh, resurrect and that will cost me money, so money I could spend on other things. We have this uh, big boss, Mr. Bossman. He's a class boss. Uh, it's called the Schempe in Norwegian. Uh, it's basically about how big, how the boss. Uh, that's the, uh, a boss that everyone will attack at the same time. So if, if I attack this, uh, every student will, will, will see the boss, Mr. Bossman, lose one HP. And uh, this is where the, the, the big uh, class activity really happens. Uh, there's a lot of discussions whenever a, a big boss is uh, released. Uh, do we want to do this? Do we don't, we don't want to do this? Uh, how much do we need to sacrifice to, to beat this boss? And different classes have different uh, strengths, so they need to uh, co combine and, and really talk about strat strategy to be able to beat them. Why would you want to beat bosses? It's to, uh, <laughs> to get rewards. Uh, and uh, the, the big bosses, the class bosses, uh, have, uh, have a big class rewards, like we, uh, we, we take a trip to, to a place nearby, or, or we go out and play a game uh, instead of uh, being inside, and, and really to, to, to increase the, the class chemistry. So uh, this is uh, what I've been doing the last uh, couple of years, and I've really seen a lot of the students really respond well to it. Um, there, there are some different kind of uh, students that respond in a different way, uh, and that's really fun to watch. Uh, you see the, uh, the, the, the thing I think is really cool, cool. That, that's the students that really didn't do anything before. They weren't engaged, they, they did minimal effort just to be able to hand something in. Uh, they really didn't really see the point. A lot of those students I've seen now see some kind of point to, to do task, uh, uh, if it's even to level up and get better equipment and, and win the game. Uh, and then I see that they get engaged in the learning and the game really don't mean that much anymore. They, they, they just like to, 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 to get better, to, to develop new skills, to, uh, to do all the tasks. Um, and you have those that just want to have fun, uh, that always like school and, and, and uh, they, they take only the fun element from the game to, to uh, be able to talk with the class, to discuss, to have something to, to focus together uh, uh, with the rest, of the rest of the group. So um, what really surprised me was the amount of talking um, around the game. So I, I, I thought at first that uh, uh, it would be something fun, uh, motivational inside the classroom, but I see outside the classroom, in the hallways, in the, in the schoolyard, they really talk about the game, they discuss what kind of uh, quests they want to do, and they, as they de uh, unlock different characters, uh, uh, they tell their friends that, oh, this quest was very nice, uh, I did a lot of nature quests, got these characters, and now I can go on a trip and find berries or, or something and, and, and get back and report to, 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 to the game. Uh, and, and then the other students get inspired to, to, to do the same and want to go to that path and, or, and someone wants to explore new paths. So that's been really fun for me to watch, uh, how, how, how the engagement uh, uh, really uh, yeah, uh, been, been a lot greater uh, after this. So that was my presentation. 
Thank you, Roger. It's so interesting to hear. And uh, as a concerned parent, I have to ask a question. How do you secure that the students really learn what they need? Yeah, uh, they, they need to submit all the uh, tasks uh, to me. We use this uh, OneNote uh, to, to submit and I see what they done. Uh, I, I have this uh, administrator page where I need to go in and confirm that yeah, they actually did, did the quest. Uh, they they done what they uh, what I uh, have to, to to get the rewards. Must be great fun to create these monsters or yeah, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, it's always always fun to create the hard ones where I know <laughs> the students have no chance to to to, to, to beat them the yeah. and, and see how they react to that. And actually, your your speech has been uh, engaging our viewers. Viewers, Andrew, a couple yeah. of questions. We've had a question from the audience. Someone said that the gamification idea is great. Um, did you do all the coding and uh, development yourself? Yeah, great question. Uh, I, I went to YouTube to, to see if there was something uh, that I could do, and, and I found this uh, uh, program called Glide Apps. And I saw some uh, instruction on how to use it, and it's really easy to use. I have no background in coding. I don't know how to code, but uh, they take an uh, Excel sheet, or a, in this case, a Google sheet, and make all the data, the data into a more friendly, <laughs> not so messy uh, way of showing it. So, so everything you saw in the presentation is just from a Google sheet. Wow. So presumably that's taking you quite a lot of time to develop this approach to learning in your classroom. Yeah, it's quite time consuming, but it's quite <laughs> it's not as time consuming as it was uh, when I didn't have the technology behind it. Yeah, because that's what I wonder, because it takes more from you as a teacher to do this, or are you, you know, do spending average time preparing yeah, as a I teacher? What, do, what would you say about that? I, I think for me it's taken quite a time to, to develop this, but uh, this year I, I all, always been doing this alone, but this year I have three other teachers that use this in the classroom and they just use the same uh, same uh, app as me and, and they don't have to do anything else than, than making their own uh, quests for, for, the, for the classes. How do you reflect on the dilemma that you're kind of transforming education into entertainment? Yeah, I think that's a good thing. I think uh, <laughs> everything today is ent entertainment uh, based and, and uh, if we want to increase motivation we have to think about it as an entertainment question as well. It's, um, it's interesting that you said earlier about the students. Do you find that students that wouldn't normally engage quite so much with, I guess, a traditional curriculum and a traditional lesson engage more with your approach? Yeah, uh, that's a few cases that I've seen uh, a big increase in, in engagement from the students that were on the bottom end of, uh, of engagement before. Uh, and um, as I said in the presentation, I, I see that uh, when we don't focus so much on the game afterwards, I, I, uh, my last class we didn't really do this the last month or two, but they still had the drive for learning. Yeah. And that's what I think was really cool to see. And Thank you so much, Roger, for joining us today. And uh, Roger's presentation will be available online uh, in a little bit. Now on to our second case. From Norway, we will travel to Arizona, USA. Learning is the driving force of games, as you just heard. A statement also by the renowned game designer Ralph Koster in his book Theory of Fun for Game Design. You will simply not succeed in getting to the next level without learning how to overcome the challenges of the game. A computer game, however, helps you to learn by the technical characteristics that best is described as adoptive. The game assesses your knowledge and abilities to ad and adapts to your individual needs to progress. Take away the universe and the storyline of a game, the adaptive technologies may very well be applied in self-contained personalized course designs for student self-learning. By adaptive technologies and reusable learning resources, there is a movement towards a more personalized learner journey. Now get ready to meet Dale P. Johnson, who is the Director of Digital Innovation at the University Design Institute of Arizona State University. He has received several awards uh, lately by the IMS Global Learning Consortium with an outstanding standing service award for his leadership of the adaptive courseware community of practice. He will now introduce us to how Arizona State University came up with what it calls 
the adaptive active approach applied in the world's first adaptive learning biology, biology degree, the BioSpine. Welcome, Dale. Hello, I'm Dale Johnson, the Director of Digital Innovation at the University Design Institute at Arizona State University. Thank you for inviting me to speak at the Know How EdTech Conference. I have 30 years experience in educational technology and I've been at Arizona State for the past eight years. Uh, our focus at the University Design Institute is on developing our institutions as powerful engines of social transformation. Uh, we are developing the ability to catalyze transformation at Arizona State and with our colleagues elsewhere. And we're really focused on reimagining, designing, and transforming the organizations that we work with in order to support this necessary change. Uh, we're working with more than 60 institutions in 20 different countries. And the focus of my talk today will be on the Digital Transformation Initiative, where we are uh, helping to create capacity to thrive in this changing digital educational environment. Uh, the, the key really is to think about the transformation holistically. Now, Arizona State University is located in the Southwest uh, United States, close to Las Vegas and Los Angeles. Uh, we're famous for the Grand Canyon. And if you ever have a chance to visit, we'll look forward to sharing that natural wonder with you. We're also famous for our Sonoran Desert, and you may have seen in the old Western movies, the saguaro cactus, which is our state tree. Uh, the university is an urban institution. We are focused on research, development, teaching, and we have a very large enrollment, uh, the largest single university enrollment in the United States. Almost 50% of our students are studying entirely online. They never come to campus. And we built that over the past decade as part of our educational extension process. The city of Phoenix, where we're located, is roughly 4.6 million people. And Arizona State is quite famous in the United States for being the most innovative university for six years in a row. Uh, part of that is because of the work we've done in digital transformation. And I'll talk to you today about how we have implemented that in the past. So once again, thank you for inviting me to speak at the conference. And I want to start off with a quote from Buckminster Fuller, who was a futurist and architect. Um, the, we never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. My talk today will be about this new model that we've built as part of our effort to improve and enhance our student success. So why do we need a new model in education? This is the primary question we all have to answer. And one of the reasons is the attention of our students is now distracted. When I went to school, we didn't have all of these digital instruments available to us, and we didn't have to worry about this. But today, we have entire classrooms full of technology, and it's harder and harder to keep the students focused on the instructional process. Even if you have enhanced the environment with technology, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that the students are gonna be focused on the instruction. As you see here with the student looking at baby photos on the computer in the back of the class. So the new model becomes imperative when we look at it in that context. Now, what is the model that has been evolving over the past 20 years in our lives? I describe this as a process of moving from mass production. These are compact discs. You may have some still left over. I have a, a bag full of them in a closet. I don't even know if I have a CD player anymore to play the music. But today we have millions of songs on our phones and we can create personalized playlists that way. The same is true with navigation. We used to have to buy a map for every city we went to. Today we have a map of the entire world on our phone. I was traveling in Korea last year I could navigate through the streets of Seoul, and I don't speak the language nor read the language. So this is transforming the way we in, integrate our lives with our societies. The same is true of medicine. We used to have one medical procedure for everyone. Today, we have DNA analysis allows us to personalize our medical experience. In education, this is where we are on the frontier the mass production model of teaching the same lesson to all students at the same time is no longer necessary nor sufficient 
to successfully enable our students for the future. So what we are developing is a mass personalization model, which is to focus the right lesson to the right student at the right time. This is a very simple phrase to describe a very complex process to build out the pedagogical and technological transformation to make this possible requires a tremendous amount of effort. So I want to talk to you today about what we did and how we did it as part of our process to move towards mass personalization. You know, first, what we did was we looked at the major courses that were causing the most failure among our students. So between 2011 and 2021, we worked systematically through these large enrollment courses, Introduction to Biology, Introduction to Chemistry, College Algebra, et cetera. And we partnered with different technology vendors to develop the technology to support this transformation. As I mentioned, the technology is necessary but not sufficient to successfully make this transformation. So we started with intro bio, as I mentioned, we've done US history, math, economics, but then after we got done thinking about those as discrete courses, we decided that it was more valuable to think about these as vertically integrated. So I'll use the biospine as our exemplar in this process. That means we've aligned the curriculum for all of these courses, general biology, genetics, evolution, and so on. We integrated all of that content into a technology platform, created all of the formative assessments to support this personalized model, and then empower the faculty with the data from that system in order to generate the transformation to enable student success. So what do we take away from that experience? That there are basic principles that we need to honor as part of this transformation. Every student has unique learning needs. We can no longer treat them as the same on the first day of class. Some students come to college with a year or two of biology education, and some have never sat in a biology class before. We cannot treat those two students the same. Students learn best by solving problems. We have to put them in a position to apply their knowledge. We cannot rely on just lectures and knowledge transfer any longer. Application is the key to their success. They have to demonstrate mastery of each lesson, not simply take the exam and move on, but the ability to recall and apply that knowledge in a mastery model. Next, the technology su success depends on the teacher. Uh, we have to retrain our faculty. We can't assume that just because the faculty are comfortable with technology that they understand this transformative model and that they can apply a new pedagogy. So a lot of our time and effort is spent helping the faculty develop these new skills. And then finally, we need to provide individualized instruction. And that means that each faculty member gets to know each student and their individual needs. The only way to do this is through data. And we use the data and the adaptive instructional systems to enhance our teaching processes. So these principles guided our development. And then we used a couple of theories. Uh, one is Bloom's taxonomy. I hope you're familiar with that. But there are different levels of learning you can see from remember through create. And what we were looking for in this new model was the proper tool for the proper job. So we found that adaptive learning before class would help to create a preparation for applied learning in class through active learning exercises. So these two different tools give us the transformation that we're looking for. The way this plays out in, uh, in the class is that information acquisition that we normally would do through lecture now occurs through the adaptive system. We also do the initial assessment, what we think of as a formative assessment online. Those two tasks can be completed much more effectively and efficiently online than in a lecture. Now, the next step is to share that data with the faculty members so that they can make decisions about how to apply those lessons in real world scenarios. So think of those as case studies or active learning exercises that is the true transformational experience. That's where the students start to deepen their knowledge and move higher in the Bloom's taxonomy. And finally, the fourth step is an assimilation process. 
where the students are integrating that new knowledge into their own framework. So all four of these steps allow the faculty and the students to transform that educational learning experience. When we think about a course, we can put these together in a series across the, the semester, and we create an experience that is unique. The online learning occurs before each class, and then in class, the faculty are leading students through their exercises. We do that week after week so that the students can develop the skills of application to uh, learn this new knowledge. Uh, we think of these as professional skills, things like creative thinking, critical thinking, collaboration, communication. Those are skills that are often discussed as part of the important foundation for professional success. So what does the class look like? Obviously, we're getting rid of the large lectures, so we don't do that anymore. What we do is we build a learning studio, which is an active learning space where students are gathering in small teams of six, and they are interacting with one another, and the faculty members are leading them through these applied exercises. Uh, this is the uh, experience that students are engaging with in order to solve problems together. And that becomes the foundation of the learning process. So to summarize, information shared online before class, information and knowledge applied in small teams during class. When we did that, what we found was a very interesting result. First, our withdrawal rate, which is the students that start the course but never receive a grade, went down dramatically from 20% to less than 2%. We attribute that to the social networks that the students build in these small teams. Every student is assigned to a team on the first day of class and they have five immediate classmates that they know. They get to become friends and they develop relationships with those classmates. After eight weeks, we change them up and they move to another team so they make five new friends. This is part of a uh, social foundation that helps the students weather the difficult times in the class. Uh, we know that the course material is complex and in order to help them uh, navigate through those complexities, they can use their classmates as another instructional resource. And we also found that the success rate, that's a grade of C or better, went up dramatically. We attribute that in part to the online instructional resources. A student can watch a lecture video more than one time. In a traditional lecture, if you miss something, it's gone forever. Online, you hit replay, watch it again until you understand it. And we see the students doing this, sometimes two or three times. So this result encouraged us to continue to expand that program. In order to make it work, we needed to build a team. We needed faculty members, instructional designers, technologists, vendor personnel. Those are very important because they understand the technology graphic designers to help build out all those instructional resources, video producers. We videotape all of the lectures to embed them in the adaptive instructional systems. Librarians to help organize all of this information. And finally, leaders. Uh, we really want to build a leadership network for supporting this transformation. This is a team process, so you have to think about it holistically. It's not a single faculty member working in isolation on an island of innovation. It's a series of networked uh, people that help the faculty members successfully complete this transformation. And leadership is an important part of that. We're talking about the department chairs, the deans, the provosts. Uh, those are the people that are important to support this type of transformation. And when we think about the biospine, we think about it as a holistic transformation across multiple courses. This is an entire degree program, which is available online and also on campus. So the brain of that effort is the faculty. The spine is the curriculum alignment across all of those courses. 
The muscles are the content and instructional resources that faculty build. The nerves are the adaptive instructional system that we use to host all of that material. And then the skin is the learner experience. How do they uh, actually interact with all of that to successfully complete their courses and get their degree? Uh, I'd like to finish with this quote, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And I want to encourage you to think about how this would apply in your environment. I know that each culture is different and there are different levels of development and different levels of tolerance for technology. Uh, but I want to encourage you to think creatively and to invent your future so that your students can succeed at a higher rate. Uh, feel free to reach out and contact me at this email. Uh, I'm always uh, willing to discuss opportunities to help you create the capacity to thrive. And eventually, we hope that you will also be role models for your colleagues at other institutions so that you can do a lecture next year about your successful implementation of a new model for instruction. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking with you, and I look forward to hearing from you in the future. Thank you, Dale. And if you have any questions, please send them to us and we'll share them with Dale for you to be answered. Andrew, there are so many things here. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's talking about nearly a tailor-made personalized education. Is, that, is it okay to go that far? I think so, because um, they've really rethought how they want learning to happen. And looking at the way they've changed the model, they've almost flipped the traditional model of learning on their head, where students actually do the kind of lecture and the learning the content prior to coming to the classroom. So, so yeah, I think it's uh, probably the way forward. And I mean, you can see from their results as well that yeah. it's clearly had a positive impact on the student learning. But then the professors and lecturers role is kind of transformed. So they're becoming more of a facilitator or manager leader. Is that OK for academic people to to change the role like that? Well, I think it's part of the change that probably needs to happen when you bring the technology into the classroom. And I think also the interesting thing is that they brought in a whole load of new support staff to actually support the te teachers and lecturers. So actually the lecturers are still the subject experts and they have video producers and graphic designers that can help them design the interactive online content for the students. So Support team there. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. Um, now on to our third case. Adaptive learning technologies provide a basis for a shift from traditional mass production of uniform education towards mass personalization. The technology aims at fulfilling individual learning needs and is on that matter probably the only feasible solution. Artificial intelligence and machine learning are technologies at the forefront, increasingly applicable also for education. A characteristic of these technologies is that they adapt learning to individual needs still in a universal manner and facilitate thus accessibility and inclusion in education. To understand more about artificial intelligence, we've asked Mike Tolfson to show us how most of you may have encountered it without knowing in a most common tool, the Microsoft Teams. Mike is the principal group manager at Microsoft Education in Seattle. He's responsible for numerous Microsoft educational initiatives, among these OneNote education product strategy and not the least Microsoft's inclusive classroom product strategy, focusing in on empowering students of all abilities. His list of rewards is long and he's named a top EdTech influencer by many, recently by the EdTech magazine and specially for Know How EdTech. Here is Mike Tholfsen. Hi, this is Mike Tholfsen from the Microsoft Education Team, and today I'm going to be talking about reading progress in Teams, which is our reading fluency tool. And by the way, jeg snakker lidt norsk. On my father's side, I'm Norwegian, and my family comes from Sandefjord, and I've been to Stavanger. So with that, we're going to get started. Now, reading progress is a free reading fluency tool built into Teams, and it uses AI. We're going to give an example here of Crystal. She's in fourth grade and she has to do reading fluency checks. And that's gonna be where Crystal reads a passage out loud in front of a teacher. 
And oftentimes the teacher will sit there and mark up the passage. Crystal doesn't really like these reading fluency checks. They can make her nervous, feel stigmatized. And reading fluency is reading speed, accuracy, as well as the expression which you read at. On the teacher side, you have Mrs. Peterson. And she cares about Crystal's reading ability. That's why she checks the reading fluency on a regular basis. Now the challenge is, is that Mrs. Peterson uses a stopwatch, a paper and pencil to capture that reading fluency. She might mark mispronunciations or omissions. It's extremely time consuming. And the teachers often will do it one student at a time. You multiply that times 27 students, whew, that's a lot of time spent. And many teachers would tell us they don't have time to listen to the students read out loud one at a time. So we said, how can we help Mrs. Peterson help Crystal practice reading out loud more often and not have to go through the same process every time and still get insights into her progress. And that's where we come up with reading progress. Again, this is built into Teams assignments. It's to improve student fluency through reading practice and educator insights. And what you'll see here in the demo is that we use AI to listen to the student when they read and record out loud. And then we can help that teacher mark up the words on the page to save time. Also, during the pandemic, this process has become even more difficult. Large scale study from Stanford showed reading fluency in earlier grades went down by about 30%. And so it's really, really hard to do this during COVID. What I'll do now is switch over to the demo and show exactly how this works, including the AI, as well as the insights and analytics that get captured and shown to the teacher afterwards. So I'm here in my class team and I'm going to go click on assignments right here. And then we'll go down to the bottom, click create and choose assignment. We'll give our assignment a title and some instructions. And now the key part to make this a reading progress assignment, go here and click attach. And when this drops down, go and choose reading progress right here. This opens up the reading progress page. The first thing you want to do is add a reading passage that you want your students to practice. Right here, I can upload a Word document or a PDF, and I'm just gonna upload a Word document to keep this simple. There's my Word document, and it immediately converts it onto this page. And now I can go and edit this if I want. So let's say I chose a PDF or a Word document, and I wanted to tweak it a little bit. I can click Edit, and right here, we have some simple editing options. You know, I can delete different things and change things, and I hit the check when I'm done. If I wanted to choose a different passage, maybe I didn't want this one, I just click here to go back. But on the right hand side are the most important parts. These are the settings for your reading progress passage. The first one is reading level. Now you can enter whatever data you want here. Maybe you use A through Z or you could use one through 10. You don't have to use a reading level at all. In this case, I'm going to set it to level J. You choose your genre. In this case, I'm going to choose nonfiction. Number of attempts. You have unlimited here and I can choose up to 10 attempts. Maybe I want to say I only want them to try four different attempts. But in this case, I'm going to leave it at unlimited. Then there's pronunciation sensitivity. I like to call this the picky dial. How picky did you want the software to be? If you're going to use auto detect to listen to the students read, you can set how sensitive it's going to be. For example, I might have younger readers and I could choose less sensitive, or maybe I have more experienced readers and I could set it to more sensitive. In this case, I'll leave it at default. Lastly, require video by default. Requiring video is on, but if I don't want the students to have video and just record audio instead, I can turn that off. In our example, I will leave requiring video on. Okay, let's finish up our assignment. In the upper right, click next. The passage is attached. Let's go up and click assign. Okay, the assignment has been made. Now we'll switch over to the student and show what it looks like to read this out loud. Now we're showing the student side. And I'm going to go down here and here is that assignment geography. Open that up. And you're going to see a special little icon next to geography. I will click this. Now we have Zoe here and she's going to start reading this passage. One other thing, we have immersive reader technology so Zoe can change the way the page looks so it's more comfortable for her to read. So we're going to quickly show what that looks like and then Zoe will start reading. Let's go. The study of Earth's landforms is called bicycle geography. 
Landforms can be mountains and valleys. They can also be glaciers or rivers. People need water to drink. They also need it for washing. Through history, people have settled near fresh water. Now, Zoe's done with the reading. She can click the little play button on her video to watch and listen to herself read. The study of Earth's landforms is called bicycle geography. She can also click the start over button if she wants to give it another try. But in this case, she's all done. She's going to click I'm finished and it'll upload the video. Now the video is uploaded and attached to this reading progress assignment. And now just like a normal Teams assignment, I'll go in the upper right and click turn in. Now we'll switch back to the educator view and show how the review student work portion works. I'm signed back in as the educator and I switched over to assignments and here are all the ones that I've made. I'm going to open this one and now I'm going to review this student's work right here and I click on the student. Now we're in the teacher review experience. This is the normal speed grader on the right hand side, but we've replaced everything else with our reading progress experience. You can see the passage here and it's marked. You can see correct words per minute, and here is the accuracy rate, the number of attempts, the levels, and the number of words. By default, we've turned on auto detect, and that is the speech process that listens for things like mispronunciations, omissions, insertions, repetitions, and self-corrections, which are tallied up at the top here. A really important note, you don't have to use auto detect. I can turn this off. Many educators think they have to use auto detect. You don't. Also note that auto detect is marked as preview right now. We hope to be improving this in the future and we've rolled it out for many different languages. I'm going to be showing it in English American language and we have a full list of the languages that we support at the link in the description of this video and on the screen. So you can turn auto detect off and manually mark things, but we're going to demonstrate with auto detect on first and then I'll show this with auto detect off. Now I'm here with auto detect mode on and you can also change the pronunciation sensitivity that we talked about, AKA that picky dial. I can change this per student. And in this case, I'll leave it as medium, the default, but I can make it less sensitive or more sensitive really easily. I'll start by playing the video of the student reading. The study of Earth's landforms is called bicycle geography. Now you can see it marked bicycle as a mispronunciation and it auto detected that the student said that word incorrectly. I'll hit play again. Landforms can be mountains and valleys. They can also be glaciers or rivers. I'll hit pause and I'm going to jump down to a different section right here. It looks like the word region was mispronounced. So what I can do is click on this and I can choose jump to word right here at the bottom of the menu. Let's watch what happens. Reggae and reg are often. I can jump to the word and see the video and hear it. Maybe there's another word like right here that was actually correct. I can click here and choose correct and it will unflag it. We also detect omissions. In this case, it looked like she skipped a few words right here. I'll click on borders and then choose jump to word. Borders, freshwater source. It looked like she skipped those three words. That was automatically flagged by our auto detect feature. We also detect both repetitions and self corrections. Right here, it looked like she repeated a word. Let's jump to the word and check it out. Feature, features of. Yep, she repeated that word. We also have self corrections. Many times a student will mispronounce the word, but then catch themselves and pronounce it correctly. This is something that many educators have requested. I'll go to combination here and jump to word. Com combination of factors that people use to do. So it catches those self corrections as well. The last piece I'll show is our insights and analytics. So all of this data is captured and put into our insights tool, which I'll show next. Now I've closed the assignment and we're going to speed ahead. And I have a bunch of different reading passages that I've already assigned. Students have submitted and I've given feedback on. We're going to go into the insights tool and look at these dashboards. Now what's nice is insights right here is now pre-installed for every class team. You used to have to add it manually. So insights is pre-installed and ready to go. So we'll click right here. Here's the main reading progress dashboard and I'll go full screen. 
These are our first dashboards, but expect these to improve over time. We have average words per minute, and I can hover over a different assignment and see what is happening all the way from here to here to here. Next, I have average accuracy rate. I can hover over to get more details, so mispronunciations, omissions, and insertions, and this is across the whole class I'm seeing right now, and I can hover. If I go to students, I can drop this down. Maybe I want to go down to Alex Wilbur. Now the data is redrawn just for Alex, and I can see different types of average words per minute for Alex, as well as his accuracy rate. I can also drill down to see this month versus the last 30 days, 60 days, or 90 days. Let's go back to all students. The last area is the word cloud. So if I scroll down here, I can see the challenging words and we have the size of the word here represents how many people had challenges with it. So if I look at physical, it looks like there were mispronunciations nine different times. There are some other words like strawberries and Olympics that people are having challenges as well. I can also filter on a specific student. So I'll go here and filter on Arden. Now the word cloud redraws for Arden and you can see he was having problems with the word Olympics. So this is really handy to see who's having problems across a class or looking at specific students like we are here with Arden. Hopefully that gives you a good sense of how reading progress works. There are actually many more features. I didn't have time to show all of them. But to note, we worked with top reading experts and scientists. We also worked with over 300 educators to develop reading progress, get feedback, and we took the latest science and research around reading and made sure that it was supported in this tool. We also encourage you to go much beyond younger students. You can have students in middle school, non-native speakers, special education, people learning a different language or world languages, even adult literacy, and our AI is supported in many languages, including Norsk, Norwegian. It is in preview right now for many languages, so the auto detect will be improved over time. I also want to make sure you know that everything follows all compliance. We are not listening or monitoring kids' data or facial recognition. Everything is fully compliant, GDPR compliant, so you don't have to worry about that. If you want resources on where you can get started with reading progress, the page is right here. I encourage you to check out the links, check out the blogs. We have interactive demos. Also note that this is available on desktop, Mac, web, iOS, and Android. So it works on any platform. And if you want today's presentation, here's a link right here. There are links. You can email me. You can reach out to me on Twitter. And there's also YouTube videos that have even more details on how reading progress works. And have a great rest of your conference. Thank you so much. And of course, it's hard to get all those links in a hurry like this. So we have published all the links from the speakers on our KnowHow EdTech website. So you can go there and find it all. Andrew, this is very interesting. This way going forward, will it be more of a hassle for teachers to deal with all these functions in Teams? Well, I think that's one thing. There are an awful lot of functions in, in many of these tools that teachers are using and teachers need time to learn these these tools because they can only be beneficial if the teachers know how to use them as you say. Are you optimistic? Do you think it's a good way going forward? Yeah, because I mean traditionally I guess in a classroom a teacher would have found it very difficult to listen to every student in the class reading so tools like that that can actually help a teacher to assess a student's reading and help them to improve I think have got to be beneficial. Do you think it will make the classroom a more uh, inclusive and accessible for all kinds of different students? I think so, and I think that's one of the, the focuses of the new curriculum in Norway is to kind of in, try and include all students in the classroom because traditionally students with special learning difficulties might have been withdrawn from the class and have had special lessons. So actually all of these tools help to make the classroom a more inclusive place. So it can also add to social mobility then, perhaps? I or? think so, yeah. That's interesting. Um, I think the one thing we have to be careful of is obviously there's an awful lot of data being collected here about students. And, uh, we'll, so it we'll could hit you later in life when you apply for a job and your you know, reading ability could be um, yeah. assessed? Or? Well, potentially, if that data is not kept secure. And I mean, we'll hear more about data and security and privacy. Uh, from a speaker later on. Thank you. Um, now changing to something completely different. Um, do you have your camera on or off in all your digital meetings during COVID? I do it 
both, I think. But please join us now on this visit to California and pay close attention because last autumn, on his last online lecture before Christmas, Dr. Brown at Chapman University faced all black cameras. He was a bit puzzled and asked his students if it was his fault that they had their cameras off. And now I encourage you to look closely and listen. I don't see anybody with their camera on. It's just kind of the new cool thing to do, not turn your camera on. I've heard that. I've heard that in some classes, nobody turns their camera on, including the instructor. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, here we go. Seriously, is it my, is it my fault do I, that you have your cameras off? So, Dr. Brown, we actually kind of wanted to do something. Um, with, your, with your cameras off? Everybody, if you want to go ahead. Oh, you guys. Oh, you're going to make me cry. Oh. I'm reading each one. You guys, thank you. Very thoughtful. <clears throat> Appreciate that. Dr. James Brown. This uh, video went viral and touched so many people in uh, many countries. How did you feel when uh, your students surprised you like this? I, I thought, oh my goodness, what have I done? I've done something wrong. I pushed the wrong button, and and so I, and so when they actually came on with the with the thank you notes, uh, I think for any instructor, it's always gratifying uh, to to receive feedback, to receive positive feedback. That, but there was so much, there was so much going on that semester that. Uh, the emotion was kind of like a wave, kind of, oh, my goodness. And, uh, you know, in a way, it was a feeling of relief. Okay, that's great that it, it worked, I, I guess, enough. It worked sufficiently uh, that, so I, yeah. I would, that's, the, that was my initial response. So the big question is, what did you do during your online classes to make you deserve this kind of praise? I, I don't think I did anything different. I tried to select interesting content. Uh, I tried to present the information in an engaging way. Uh, I tried to provide opportunities for my students to construct their own meaning. And so I just used the same format. It just was on screen, I guess, uh, like this. We have the students with us. Valentina and Caitlin uh, were behind this uh, fantastic surprise. And uh, Valentina, uh, could you... Uh... Tell me why you decided to surprise uh, Professor Brown? Well, a few of my friends, including Caitlin and I, um, we found this video that was kind of like a little bit, had a little bit of traction online. And we were like, oh, this is like a really fun idea. We should do this for Dr. Brown. He's always there for us. He really cares about his students. And you can tell he even put together like a little Halloween, like social distancing thing during Halloween and said, okay, all my students can come to my front porch. Like I'll have a bowl of candy. We can be social distanced. We can meet up even though we're not able to meet in person for classes. So you can tell that he really goes above and beyond for all of his students and um, he just deserved it and I know he had issues with um, uh, Zoom and stuff. He, there was a moment that he like ended the class early by accident so he was like a little bit of a few a few little mishaps throughout the year so he just really deserved to be like appreciated to the, to the full extent so that's why we decided to put this together and, and I messaged everybody in the class during class and I was like hey well, we're gonna do something like this and um, everybody was so down because they all know how great Dr. Brown is. Yeah, the Dr. Brown video went totally viral on all social media and got picked up by news media around the world. I think it hit a nerve in students and teachers who in a tense situation of months of socialist isolation and lockdowns had to get by with their students and teaching the best way they could online. And the step they took when the pandemic sent us all home was to the most familiar, the live webinars, the Zooms and Teams, and it felt endless. And then the debate was on, cameras on or off? Students' privacy rights versus forced attendance. 
teachers' self-obsession versus students' indifference, entrapment versus engagement, and so on. And few really ask the question, what does it really take to engage students to offer their time on exactly your teaching, if force is ruled out? And to help us on that question, we've got two of the founders of the longest running master programs on ICT for teachers here in Norway. And that's Aslaug Grove Almos. She's an associate professor and Anders Grove Nilsen. He's a senior lecturer, both at the Western Un Norway University of Applied Science. And um, please let us know how we can engage students online. Yes, thank you. We have some reflections we want to share with you. And we will talk about how to engage students online. We would like to organize this uh, uh, minute as a conversation presenting some dilemmas uh, which we are concerned with. This means we do not have all the questions, uh, all the solutions. Uh, we won't uh, present specific activities and tools for every online learning context. We are social learning theorists and practitioners which means that learning occurs in a social context with a dynamic interaction of the person, environment and behavior. In this, there is an assumption that students best learn when they are involved and active in the teaching in different ways. It's not transmitting what is known from someone who knows to someone who doesn't. Okay, so let's start with the students that uh, each semester appear on my screen. Yes, and here she is. As you can see, she's energetic and ready for takeoff. And I have preferred cahoots, flinga, breakout rooms, different mentimetopoles, and uploaded lots of pre-recorded videos. But are you, are you really sure they are visible? and want to be involved? A recent German research project has summarized students in online learning 2020. They ask, do we have a generation invisible or not? And this question comes because of the students' non-use of webcams in online learning. We also know from the Norwegian public debate last year and that black screens are widely discussed. But our own research and experiences coping with teaching online or on campus and search for students' voices call attention to this flexibility dilemma for our students. It's most comfortable to switch off the camera, but even students agree that learning are best when it hurts and when they participate in our learning activities. In some contexts, it's important for these young students to expose themselves and start as influencers on Instagram. In an educational setting, it is the non-visible student that appear in most cases. Yes. The act of uh, engaging is challenging. But if everyone wants to have their cameras off and everyone wants to watch recordings and doesn't meet synchronous, that means I, as a teacher, are the lonely one in Zoom. Engaging in learning at any time, anywhere, and at any pace is even more challenging. And our students were not all agreed on a way to solve this. But still, our experiences, what we hear is that they want structures. They want a structure. Yes, they do Google and YouTube, everything, and use sources we don't bring. But as they say, they don't want tons of resources and links. They want a tailor-made plan which make them pass the exam. And they want the timetable. As one of them said, it structures me to come to school every day. Whether it's 
on campus or online? And then it's suitable to move to the social learning space. We started this presentation embedding our learning practice in a social context. We know that sharing and togetherness stimulates learning processes positively. But are they online at the same time when you offer recordings? Do they share? Exactly. This represents our next dilemma. How do we establish our social learning space with all of these diverging interests and possibilities? Uh, what can we do to make them commit and contribute to our learning community? Yes, that's... I think this is the search for the silver bullet of online teaching. If we ask K-12 teachers, uh, most of them will will answer relations, relations, relations. And I think if we, we notice um, the student Valentina's comments to Dr. Brown in the video, she says about him as a, a professor, he's always there for us. He really care about his students. He really goes above and beyond for all of his students. We also have some good stories where our students meet to mingle and drink wine on the internet. But most of them knows the feeling of loneliness and being lost in space and curriculum. We all like the feeling of inclusion and we like to be seen by other students and our teachers. Uh, okay, Anders, uh, the teacher is your new keyword, I guess. Yes, yes, um, and, and I think the main challenge for me and online teachers is to establish uh, some kind of or a, a code of, of conduct with my students. What to do, when and by whom. And of course, this depends on uh, our competence, size of the group, available tools, and so on. Yes, and I try this. I prepare lessons and activities. I send my students into breakout rooms to let them discuss. But my students are concerned with utility maximization, perhaps more in online settings than in physical classrooms. As one of them said, I'm not here to socialize with my peers peer students in breakout rooms all the time. You are the professor and I want to listen to the professor's voice. But we have to stand in this dilemma as teachers. Hmm. And we need the rules, routines, we need to praise, act on misbehavior and to foster engagement, which is the big five when it comes to, to classroom management. Okay, time's running. If we are to summarize the question, how to engage students online, can't we just use some of the hundred, hundreds of tips and tricks we have been offered via Facebook groups? Or what do you think? Oslo, if we look at this student in the middle, in this context. There are lots of tricks and tips out there for teachers. But they are mostly without the contextualizing knowledge that is needed. I have to decide what works in what situation. It's only me as a professional teacher that can stand in all these dilemmas. And as Dr. Brown, sometimes we succeed. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you, guys. So interesting to hear. And I'm trying to, you know, pick up of the es essence of what you're saying. And I have picked out four words, and I want you to briefly comment on that 
It's physical, social, context and online. If you can mix that together, you have like a success for a recipe for success. Is that correct or would you agree? Any comments? Maybe you can start with your what happened to your students this semester? Yes, I, I think the, the uh, we think we have to, to to have the holistic thought in our minds when we are orchestrating the class and the whole semester for our students. What shall we do when we are meeting physical and what shall we do when we are online? Um, this fall uh, I've started a five student point uh, uh, study uh, with a three day uh, physical uh, in Bergen on our campus uh, and uh, it was very obvious that we we were all missing such uh, context for discussing and meeting and looking at each other and and uh, testing our hypothesis and, and reflections on each other. So we have to have both of these uh, settings, I think, and <coughs> to, to make this mix. Yeah. It was interesting what you were, uh, when you were talking about classroom management, because I think actually that's one of the things that probably teachers need to think a little bit more about, is that you think about when you're managing students in a physical class, but actually one of the things that I think I've seen a lot during the pandemic is teachers then trying to basically substitute digital technologies for that being physically in the classroom. Do you think there's a different way of managing students online to in a classroom setting? I, I don't think it's so different, but I think when we are meeting physical, we, we don't think about it because we have lots of traditions to meet and in a classroom I and mean, the school is uh, many hundred years old and we know the tradition we don't think about these five but when we are going into the digital classrooms we, we are not sure how how are, am I able to speak now or what shall I do what does he think that I shall do or all of these things. We, as, that's why I said we have to establish the code of conduct in such rooms. Thank you, guys. We are going to move forward uh, to a different topic. That's GDPR. We've seen several examples today on how technology can be used consciously for the benefit of students' learning, which in other ways would have been difficult to achieve. These cases, however, work well because they rely on tracking of both student performance and personal data to adapt to the students' needs, much like social media and any web services use not only your personal information, but also the personal information of people like you to adapt to what they expect is of your interest. But uh, you all have also heard the stories on how your personal data may both be big business and exploited to manipulate you. To protect your interests and private data from any misuse, the European Union in 2018 introduced GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which is good. Few of you, however, honestly can say that you know the scope of the GDPR, if you even can spell out the acronym, but you should. Just a few weeks ago, WhatsApp was fined 225 million euros for breaches of the GDPR. And make no mistake, the same will go for schools and universities. An unintended consequence then of GDPR is that schools and teachers refrain or limit their use of educational technology and online learning aids, just to be on the safe side. Voltaire, the French philosopher in the 1700s, set out to claim, the best is the enemy of the good. We at Know How EdTech have let our journalist Steiner Figved investigate consequences of GDPR for education and ask the question, GDPR for better or worse? Have a look at this. På skolen här får elevene akkurat nå undervisning i geometri ved hjelp av en app kalt Euclidia. Men er det læreren gjør her inne egentlig lovlig? Ok, da skal vi begynne å bruke et nytt program som heter Euclidia. Det er egentlig et lite spill på en måte, men det skal hjelpe dere med å øve på geometrioppgaver. 
hvis man får tilsyn på dette, så kan det hende at dette blir vurdert som ikke innenfor. Du tar en risiko her? Ja, jeg tar en, en, en kvalifisert risiko. I 2018 ble EUs personvernforordning en del av norsk lov. New technologies and the global use of the internet bring new risks for personal data. The new data protection rules were introduced to keep your data safe. GDPR skal sikre at personopplysninger ikke blir brukt uten et rettslig grunnlag. Normalt er dette et samtykke, som når vi aksepterer cookies på nettsider. Fullt så enkelt er det ikke i skolen. Samtykke skal normalt ikke brukes i undervisning, fordi elevene ikke vil ha et reelt valg til å si nei. Her er det skoleeier som må dokumentere behovet for å samle inn dataene, og forsikre seg om at disse kun blir brukt til det formålet de er tiltenkt. Du som elev skal føle deg trygg på at skolen, dine foreldre og andre tar vare på opplysninger om deg. Da kan norske skoleelever og foreldre være trygge på det. Jeg har kjørt nå egne undersøkelser som sier hverken eller, men det er mange bekymringer av amerikanske selskaper som leverer skoleløsninger, lærere som tar i bruk gratis apper i undervisningen, og at de som man kaller gjerne skoleeier og andre ikke har fullt ryggdekning til lærerne, slik at lærerne føler seg veldig alene i hvilke verktøy de skal velge. Selv om vi ikke er logget inn, så vil det lagre oss en del ting i forhold til hvordan jeg nå velger å bruke dette nettstedet med den reklamen som er der. Google, YouTube og norske nettaviser samler daglig store mengder data om norske skoleelever, men så lenge selskapene ikke vet navnet på eleven, regnes det ikke som personopplysning. Problemet oppstår når læreren ønsker å bruke en tjeneste som appen Euclidia, som krever innlogging. Så, så jeg vil kunne gå inn på Odinøsen på profilen min, og så vil jeg da kunne se de to tingene som man da har lagret. Er det OK? Ja, så i utgangspunktet så mener jeg at det er OK. Men hadde vi spurt datatilsynet, så hadde de nok sagt at dette er en personopplysning. Så her må jeg ha en databehandleravtale med Plidia, som sikrer at de som har lagt dette ikke bruker disse personopplysningene. Og denne opplysningen om hvor langt jeg har kommet til noe annet enn i praksis å gi meg denne tjenesten. Har du en sånn avtale? Nei, jeg har ikke en sånn avtale med Euclidia. Det har jeg ikke. Og det er fordi at jeg anser at den, disse opplysningene her er så lite farlige opplysninger i forhold til det som vi får igjen for selve tjenesten og bruken av programmet. I tillegg til å være lærer er Odin også rådgiver for personvern i Randeberg kommune. Dermed er det han som har vurdert appen og besluttet at den kan brukes. Bare med å bruke en nettleser så gir du fra deg veldig mye opplysninger som kan være vel så privat som de to tingene der. Men det å bruke vg.no i undervisning eller ja, okay. YouTube under login, det, det er egentlig helt ok. Ja, det er det ingen som reagerer på. Via e-post får vi kontakt med den Hongkong-baserte utvikleren av Euclidia. Han forteller at appen blir brukt i undervisning i Europa, men at det aldri har kommet noen forespørsler eller klager knyttet til GDPR. Når vi spør om det er mulig for Annaberg kommune å få en databehandleravtale, får vi ikke svar. Som en del av GDPR har tilsynsmyndighetene i det enkelte land anledning til å skrive ut bøter. I mars fikk Ålesund kommune 50 000 i bot fra datatilsynet etter at lærerne hadde tatt i bruk treningsappen Strava. Hos oss så ble den appen tatt i bruk i koronatida. Da, det var jo en krevende situasjon og elevene var ikke på skolen. Men då skulle det lika vara undervisning och så tog lärarna i bruk teknologi för att få och skapa god tillpassa upp läring i en period där eleverna trängde det. Men det var inte ett gott system på plats för att söka om godkänning till att bruka nya appar. Så de tog det i bruk utan att ha fått godkänt någon plats. Men när den saken här dukket upp så tok vi jo tak i den med en gang. Og det vi oppdaget, det var vel at det var et kompetansehull når det gjelder GDPR i 
stora delar av organisationen. Så vi måste börja jobba med det med en gång. Och vi startar med att etablera ett system eh, som säkrar att apper som blir tagit i bruk blir värderat i förhåll till säkerhet. Ett snabbt sök i databasen GDPR Enforcement Tracker visar att Norge ligger långt över genomsnittet när det gäller GDPR-böter. Ingen andra land har skrivit ut fler böter till skolägare. Den är viktig och den är riktig. Men samtidigt har fokus på det gjort att tror jag att man har mistat ett visst spelrum. Men med det så menar jag inte att det ska vara fritt fram. För här är det ju begått i för så vidt i historia någon allvarlig glipper och någon såna små övertramp som datatilsyn helt riktigt har påpekat att det inte var bra. Samtidigt så står man i fara för att det blir för mycket nej det kan man inte som får en motreaktion om att ja men då bara gör man det utan att säga det till någon. Och så är det att finna en en, en balans mellan de goda tjänsten som är tillgängliga som är kanske vanskelig att få innanför ett helt lite rigid förstått GDPR system. Är Norge en värsting när det kommer till personvärn? Eller har Odin i Ranneberg rätt i att fokus på övertramp har fört till att skolan har fått för lite spelrum? I Arendal samlas politiker och påverkare för att diskutera viktiga temor. I år är det tätt mellan debatterna om personvärn. En fersk rapport från konsulentbolaget Bove berättar att det står dåligt till med personvärnet i skolan. Då jag såg resultatet så blev jag lite förfärdad för jag tänkte att det här bekräftar ju den frukten vi hade. Och det vi må ge lärarna det är en trygghet att de kan ta de rätta valgen. Det vill säga si att man måste ta veck de osäkra valgen genom gode verktyg, genom gode rutiner, enkla förståeliga vägledningar som gör att de kan ha de kan veta att de hanterar personupplysningar på en trygg och ordentlig måte och ha självtillit runt det. För det har de inte idag. Men vi måste ge dem de förutsättningarna. Finns det ett större handlingsrum än den den enkla läroupplevelsen? Ja, för det eh tänker på för exempel det med vilka värde man kan bruka och akademisk frihet så är det egentligen större handlingsrum hvis kommunen hade orket eller hvis man kunde fått en godkänning då att dessa dessa applikationer eller nätstäderna är säkra så kunde de ha en mycket större frihet. Men det vi upplever nu är att de inte törr att ta dem i bruk. Och så för att det är en större byråkratisk och dyr process att värdera den. Eller så går det helt andra vägen att de tänker att nej, vet du vad, det orkar jag inte. Jag bara brukar det värdet här. För det fick jag tips om från några andra. Och det är nästan lika illa. Så idag så så det är det kunde enkelt det kommunen då som som må... Ja, det är de som är behandlingsansvariga och som egentligen må göra dessa värderingar och det är klart det klarar de inte i 256 kommuner och 11 fylkeskommuner. De har ingen chans. Utbildningsdepartementet har föreslått en felles tjänstekatalog för digitala läringsresurser, alltså ett uppslagsverk med appar det är OK att bruka i skolan. Kan de svara på om Euclidia är OK? Det är skolan som har ansvar för att se på att GDPR och personupplysning ska vara följs av de enskilda skolorna. Så hvis de gör den värderingen så och de menar att det är för så ska man kunna möjlighet att och se på så den typen ting. Så kanske är handlingsrummen för GDP är något större än det det många tänker sån där medelbart. Och det finns mer än några resurser där ute som eh också inte eh levererar stora mängder data som vill vara strikt med GDP om enkelt att leva. Det finns massor av resurser som är helt fint och lätt att ta. Ja, har du en lista vi kan få låna? <laughs> Nej, har sedan nationella godkända listan det slår jag. Där nog i alla fall. Vi stöttar detta princip om en så kallad tjänstekatalog. Och formålet med det är nettop det att lärarna ska ha en lång smörbrödslista av resurser, appar, läromedel och inte minst och läringsresurser och verktyg som de kan välja mellan och vara kreativa i sin i sin upplärning av alla våra elever. Så du menar att det finns många fler läromedel som som kunde vara brukt som som inte blir brukt idag för det man är rädd för att att det inte uppfyller kraven. Ja, det kan gå tvärre. Europakommissionen är EU:s utövande myndighet och ska se till att EU:s lagstiftning överhålls i alla medlemsländerna. Protection, the protection of personal data, I mean is a concern, it's a growing concern for 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 citizens. I mean there the, the, the is a before and after uh, 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 GDPR and also the fact that you are using the term GDPR which is an acronym 
Uh, I don't know how many acronym of EU legislation you know, but uh, but uh, the fact that you know this acronym uh, shows the, the importance of uh, of data protection. Kan Europa Kommission svare Rannebar kommune på om appen de brukar är i tråd med GDPR? If it's not possible to get this process, uh, this data processing agreement, is it then clear that it's it's not possible to use? The service, or is well, there any way around that? I mean, uh, uh, I mean, the conclusion is that you 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 don't want to 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 be yourself in breach of the of the GDPR and and bear the consequences of such uh, uh, breach. So uh, um, uh, I think it's very important for the controller to 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 have processors uh, who, who, uh, with reasonable assurances uh, with a proper uh, uh, contract. Uh, so that you also protect yourself as a, as a, as a data controller. As a commission, we will not, uh, you know, comment on, on a specific product because this is really for the controller. And then this is for the Norwegian DPA, the independent body, to assess. It's the one who will use the service, in this case, a geometry app, who has responsibility for that they follow the rules. Og hvis de har vurdert at dette er i overensstemmelse med GDPR, så er jo det sånn systemet skal fungere. Da har de gjort den vurderingen. Men en databehandleravtale skal man jo inngå. Og så er det ikke sånn at det skal være noe spesielt form og formkrav og sånt noe på den. Men det er klart hvis vi kommer på tilsyn til et sted som har brukt den fremgangsmåten der, så kommer vi nok til å stille noen kritiske spørsmål og gå nøye gjennom den kontrakten som de gjør i den Terms of Use, eller hva det heter som ligger på nettet, for å se om de har gjort en riktig vurdering. Men i utgangspunktet så har jo den skolen da gjort en riktig vurdering, nettopp fordi at de har gått inn og sett på er dette noe som er all right, og så har de konkludert med det. Så det er liksom starten på en god personvernprosess, det altså. Så kanskje er det greit å bruke denne appen? Ja, det kan det godt være. Det kan det godt være, og hele grunntanken i GDPR, det er jo at det er det virksomheten som skal vurdere først. Se, er det her noe vi kan bruke? Og hvis de gjør grønt lys, så er det, jeg håper å si, det vi kan gjøre det er å gå på kontroll og se om det stemmer eller ikke. Vi er på topp i Europa når det gjelder å og gi bøter til skoleeiere. Ja, det kan nok hende, men det er sånn at når det gjelder... Altså, GDPR er jo et europeisk regelverk, men så har vi litt selvbestemmelse. Og blant de områdene hvor vi har selvbestemmelse er om offentlige virksomheter og offentlige etater skal omfattes av regel eller ikke. Og Norge er en av de ikke alt for mange landene som har sagt at, ok, overkrelsesgebyrer, det kan vi jo skrive ut også til kommuner. Så det er nok også noe av forklaringen. Men så er det jo også at vi har en stor kommunal sektor i Norge, og en fylkeskommunal sektor er også viktig når det gjelder skoler, så klart. Og kommunene, de tilbyr veldig, veldig mange tjenester til innbyggerne. Det er også skoler, det er barnehager, det er eldresenter, det er PPT-en, det er masse forskjellige ting. Så det at vi har spesiell oppmerksomhet på en av de stedene i landet vårt hvor det samles mest opplysninger og mye sensitive opplysninger, og mange opplysninger som vi ikke frivillige deler, men som vi må dele for å få tjenester, det er naturlig at vi har veldig stor oppmerksomhet om det. Tilbake i Randenberg kan vi litt mer om personvern, men innser at vi aldri fikk noe helt klart svar. Så kanskje det er greit å bruke denne appen? Ja, det kan det godt være. Hvis dere jo hørte selv, altså han sier jo for så vidt Terms of Youth and Privacy Policy, jo da det kan kanskje, for det er ikke noe formkrav på databehandleravtale, men det han snakker om litt senere, det er jo et relativt tydelig formkrav med en behandlingsansvarlig og en databehandleravtale. Hvis de hadde kommet og kikket og ikke likte, så hadde de mer sagt at dette er et avvik som må lukkes. Og den eneste måneden å lukke det på er i praksis å ikke bruke det. Og så hadde man antageligvis ikke fått bot fordi man hadde gjort det som var intensjonen i loven med å gjøre en vurdering, men man hadde gjort en feil vurdering. Rommet for skjønn blir vanskelig å finne. Og det gjør også at når du da går litt sånn og snakker med andre, så er også andre veldig usikre. Fordi at de er redd for å selvfølgelig falle i unåde hvis de får tilsyn av datatilsynet og havner på feil side. Og da overkompenserer en kanskje andre enn med å bare si nei, jeg er ikke sikker helt, så da gjør vi det ikke. Og det tror jeg det er en del kommuner som også mener at når de prøver å ta kontakt med datatilsynet med konkrete problemstillinger, så blir det ofte en resitering av lovverk 
og en setning om at dette må dere vurdere selv. Og så står hun der. Andrew, um, the GDPR and the personal data, would you say it's a hinder for schools? Um, I think it's a bit of both. You know, it's, it is right that we protect students' data and if you think about most students at school, they're under the age of 16, so they're not able to make an informed choice really about the use of their data. So it's right that schools have a responsibility to protect student data. But at the same time, as the video pointed out, there are schools and communa that are avoiding using digital tools just because they don't have the capacity or the skills to actually do the assessments that are needed. So where do we go from here? Um, I think it's, com it's, it's complicated, <laughs> yeah. but I think as the video pointed out, some kind of national catalogue of applications that were approved for use in school but I also think some of the responsibility should be pushed back to technology companies that if technology companies want their products to be used in school, they need to do far more than just providing lots of documents that schools use to make their own assessments. They need to actually help schools to do these assessments about whether tools can be used in the classroom. What we know for sure is that this is not the end. Thank you, Andrew. This will be continued for sure. We're going live now to London to Dean Stokes. He is the head of education adoption for Europe, Middle East and Africa called EMEA at Google. Working in an English secondary school for nine years, he taught media and took responsibility for training teachers on the effective use of technology. Since his time in a school, Stokes has trained thousands of teachers around the world and now helps education systems at all level to think about their approach to supporting educators in making the best use of Google's technology for learning, teaching and administration. Here at NoHo EdTech, Dean will talk about how technology can help provide quality education for all and share insight on the next generation digital learning environments. How are you, Dean? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me and good to be here. It's nice to have you. Uh, I think we should just let people get what they want. Kick it off, Dean. <laughs> thanks, invite. Now, I've been watching along all day. I think it's been a really interesting day with many different perspectives. And it's really left me asking a question, which is this. Will schools ever be the same? And I wonder if you're asking yourself the same question at the end of this day too. Well, let's start with a simple exercise. I want you to imagine a classroom. And chances are, when you're doing that, you're probably imagining some spaces that look a little bit like these pictures. Rows of desks, perhaps facing the front where there's a teacher's desk. Perhaps if there are younger students that you're teaching, there might be a spot on the carpet for some reading. But really, the classroom itself that physical space within a school, I don't think it has changed at all, really. Though if we think of back to the last 18 months, for one and a half billion students around the world, that physical space that they were in really did change. You know, they were trying to find a spot to sit and learn from perhaps somewhere in their house, or a teacher was perhaps teaching from uh, a dining room table. But the reality now is that many of those school systems are returning back to those physical spaces that are exactly the same as they were before. So have schools changed? Well, I'm not sure about that, but I do keep hearing that education has changed forever as a result of this remote distance or hybrid learning that's been taking place globally through the pandemic. I'm not sure I agree with that statement either. Has it really changed already, forever? Or is it actually that education is just changing? And I think that education is actually in a constant state of change. Teachers have always had to keep up with the latest trends or the latest research uh, to really understand how to deliver effective teaching and learning. Now, there's no doubt, though, that the pandemic has been a catalyst especially when it comes to using technology in the classroom. 
you know, through the pandemic, we've seen schools more deeply integrate technology. We've seen teachers rewrite lessons for a digital world. We've seen students adapt to the digital tools that they need to use as well. So thinking back through all the things today, there are three trends or things that I think are going to happen uh, as we move forward into this future of education that will constantly change as technology improves and as we better understand how people learn. The first thing is, it's clear that education is going to become more personalized. We saw some really good examples of this earlier, even with the gamification example. It's all about personalizing the experience to a student. Now, with growing class sizes, it's really difficult for a single teacher to keep on top of where every student is. And so I think technology is going to play a big role in helping with that. Secondly, I think it's going to be more measurable. Now, if we're personalizing that learning, uh, where perhaps there's learning happening outside of the classroom as well as inside, where you can't see it as a teacher, it's important that we can measure all of that, what's happening everywhere, all of the learning in some way or another. We need to understand where people are getting stuck and where they're not. And finally, I think education needs to be more equitable. We're still in a position where globally not everybody has access to a high quality free education. And so I think technology has a part to play in that too. So let's just take a moment to dive a little bit deeper into each of these three topics. So first, personalized learning. You know, this isn't a new concept. The late Sir Ken Robinson has been talking about this for a long time. But I think what's possible now is perhaps different to many years ago. Technology really has come along to a place where uh, we can personalize learning at scale. And I think we'll continuously see improvements in this area as we see improvements in AI and ML. Now, some places have even taken the personalization part to the physical space that I mentioned at the beginning. These are some pictures from Agora School in the Netherlands. It's a very forward-thinking school that actually has no timetabled lessons. Students uh, really lead their own learning and decide on the projects that they want to work on, including customizing their desk with half of an old car. So let's just take a look at how technology might help in this area. Now, two quick examples of things that are already exist that are helping deliver more personalized learning. One is an app by Google called Read Along. It's a free app to help children learn how to read, and it uses Google's text-to-speech and speech recognition technology to gamify the experience for a child learning English. And secondly, Google Lens. With Google Lens, I can take a picture of a concept, perhaps, that I'm stuck with in my maths homework. And Google Lens will bring back not just the answer, but actually helpful videos or content from across the web to help you learn and better understand that concept at hand. So these things already exist. But these are perhaps more when you're learning on your own individually. So what might personalization look like through a technology lens in future? Well, at Google for Education, we're really thinking about how to be more assistive. So I'm going to share a few examples today. And back when I was in the classroom, I used to spend a lot of time bringing materials together from one place or another, perhaps from a textbook or from a website or from a scheme of work that another colleague had shared with me. So I think in future, um, this assistive technology will perhaps help recommend content to teachers as they go and set an assignment in Google Classroom, for example. It could be content from across the web. It could be something they've used before. Uh, or it could be something that other teachers in the school have used to teach the same concept. Second, I think we uh, have to deliver real-time feedback in order to, to have truly personalized learning. And so in those moments where a teacher isn't in the room, being able to see what a student's doing, they are still getting the help they need at that moment where they're stuck so that they can then move forward and not come back to the next lesson any further along. And finally, which will lead me into the second point of being more measurable, we have to provide the teacher summaries of this information. 
if they can't see it, what can we provide them to really give them a good picture of what's happening? So whilst our tools aren't quite there doing all of this just yet, we have created the foundation for this in the future. So let's think about being more measurable. When I think about measurability of learning and technology, I kind of wonder, what if we could measure learning in the same way that we can measure blood results when you go for a blood test, for example? What if we could get down to that level of detail? And if we think about how technology is supporting now, one example is that we're now providing teachers an engagement dashboard in Google Classroom to see which students have engaged with content and, and which haven't. And there are already some third parties taking data from platforms like Google Classroom and others to really make insights from that data to provide to the teacher and really think further along as well and understand how a student might do in a particular environment or, or subject. And moving forward into the future, it's really going deeper into those class-wide summaries. If we really understand how and where and what students are learning, then can we go back to the teacher so that they're able to focus on the areas that we know students were stuck with when they were learning themselves, be it at the home or even in a classroom while a teacher is, is facilitating a session. And so I think calling out areas that most students struggled with um, to make sure that the teachers can create that human connection, which is so important in education, and that they can continue and see success from all of their students in front of them. And finally, it has to be equitable. So education as a whole needs to be available to everybody. And there's a huge rise in informal education. These are just some websites and platforms that exist now where you can sign up for yourself and go and learn pretty much anything that you want to. And these are just a small subsection of, of a growing number uh, of companies doing a very similar thing. And so at Google, we really believe that everyone deserves equal access to, to great learning experiences. That's why since 2006, Google Workspace for Education has been free to schools globally. And one of the reasons that Chromebooks are, are, are so uh, good, such good value for schools, not only are they simple and secure, but they are perhaps a lower cost than traditional devices. And when we think about learning uh, at Google, it really sits across everything we do. So whether you're learning for school in that classroom environment uh, that we're all familiar with, we've all been through that, whether you're learning for work to perhaps gain a certification, perhaps through one of those uh, platforms that we saw a moment ago, or whether you're learning for fun to pick up new skills, Google helps everybody. So just to recap, three things that I think were really clear from all of the presentations that we saw today, and that is that education is going to be more personalized, more measurable, and more equitable. So thinking back to that question that I asked at the beginning, will schools ever be the same? Well, the physical spaces have started to change, but for the most part, they look the same. But I do think education is certainly going to change a lot as we move into future. But if there's one thing that I want to leave you with, it's this, is that to make any of this change possible, it has to be driven by all of us. We need to do more research and come to consensus on what works and what doesn't, and what the right approach is to learning and what isn't. We still know very little about how the brain learns. We've got a lot to learn about that. And I think as we improve in that area, we'll see changes everywhere. But when you walk away from today and you come back tomorrow to be inspired for some more sessions, just remember that you, whether you're a teacher, a student, a parent, somebody else involved in education in some way, an onlooker, ultimately we all have a part to play in making sure the students of tomorrow are successful and leave school not just with the skills that they need to thrive, but also to be well-rounded citizens in the world that we now live in. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much for your time. And I hope you've had a good day at the Know How EdTech Conference today and, and enjoy tomorrow if you're coming along as well. 
Thank you so much, Dean. Uh, it was so interesting to hear you, and uh, we are a little bit over time, but a few reflections before we leave each other today. What do you think all these things that you present for us now will require from teachers in the future going forward? Yeah, I mean, my role is focused on teacher training and professional development. So I really recognize that any kind of change, technology or not, needs good change management. Um, I think one thing that I'm not seeing a lot of right now is embedding this training on technology and thinking about how to meaningfully use technology in the classroom is happening at that basic teacher training level. It's really variable globally. I think we need to start to think about technology as another tool that you have in your toolbox. So very much like thinking that we need a pencil case with a pen and a pencil and a ruler to come into school, and clearly they're tools that I would be using when I'm training to be a teacher. We need to think uh, about technology in the same way. Thank you, Dean. Um, I'll leave you to it there, but I have one question for Andrew with me here in the studio. And he's, of course, uh, working for Google. And yep. I know all the kids have their Chromebooks and they're really good. But is there a danger there? They become addicted to this system and sort of will be Google hooligans for the rest of their lives. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess if you're cynical, yeah. you might think that's why all technology companies engage so much with education, because it's in some ways about kind of getting them used to working with their technology systems from an early age in the hope that when they go into the world of work, that will be what they come to expect. But um, is it a positive outlook that we can go home with today? Well, I think Optimistic? Yeah, I think we've seen that technology provides many, many possibilities. But I think we should be critical and we should think as teachers and educators about the role that we want technology to play in education rather than just letting it kind of be pushed upon education. Wise words. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. And I want to thank everyone else also of our guests for sharing their knowledge today. We are wrapping up, uh, but do not forget our special session about useful and practical examples on digital teaching avail available for you on the KnowHow EdTech website. There you'll find two sessions that you may access at any time. One is Play at Heart, a recent initiative by Denmark's university colleges together with the Lego Foundation and a part of the Playful Learning Program. Uh, play at Heart focuses on children's play and construction with technology in order to perform in a digitalized world. The second session is by the ICT resource group for the schools in Stavanger, Norway, and they believe ICT should be used to strongly modify or redefine teaching and will provide you with examples of how to do it. If you missed some of the sessions today, recordings of KnowHow EdTech will be available on our website and YouTube. Share them with anyone. Thanks again to expert Andrew and to our supporters that make KnowHow EdTech possible. Thanks for being with us. And we're not done. We're coming back tomorrow. I hope to see you then. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>